Okay, so we're looking at rate determining step, which I'll get to in a minute. But that's the bit of the syllabus we're doing. Um, so if I could start with a bit of a recap from you, if I could have the mechanism for this reaction, please. Oh yes, mechanism. Ready? Don't go away. I would like the mechanism for that reaction. Curly arrows in all their glory. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so, AQA are pretty clear about this. You, you don't need to put in partial charges, the delta pluses and delta minuses, in order to get full marks on the mechanism. But you should know they're there. So you might not put a delta plus on the carbon, but knowing that there's a delta plus on the carbon would help you make sense of the direction the electrons are going, yeah? Because because it's all about pluses and minuses. Determine, what does that say? Rate determining step. Of step. Yeah. Yeah, I seem to draw my S as a figure eight, but... Um, <laughs> so I feel it's here. Oh, my question is about have you got a um, have you got a type of mechanism there? Nuclear theory substitution. Lovely. <laughs> Let's just uh, take a moment to remind ourselves what those words mean. What is a nuclear file? Let's go to start here. How, how many electrons? Pair Electron pair donor. Very good. And a substitution reaction? Is that just like the way the one function of loses is played by another? Exactly right. Something comes off, just like a substitution in football. Somebody comes off, somebody goes on. So in this case, the bromine is swapping for the OH. As you said, one functional group and is changed for another. And then positions. In what? Nuclear bit substitution. Is? Aqueous and these box. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're giving me uh, giving me some conditions. That's nice. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, as opposed to um, elimination, but you, you know all about that. Okay. Uh, so what? I've just drawn the displayed formula of bromoethane there, so we can see see some some bonds. Uh, you and what else am I going to draw? And the OH group, the hydroxyl, yeah, OH minus, and uh, two electrons on the pair. Yeah, we have to have that lone pair because, um, as I can't remember, as you said, it's an electron pair donor, our nucleophile. So uh, we need to be able to see the electron pair. Well, you curly to, arrow? Yeah, it has to go curly, we have to go two. Right? Just give me the first one. First, well, it, has a, well, it's, it's it does very good, which is kind of the point of the lesson. But um, whichever way you want to go first is fine. Well, I suppose if they force us to do the carry arrow from the um, carbon bromine bond, the carry arrow from the bond onto the bromine. Okay, from the carbon bromine bond on the bromine. It's a slightly brighter orange there, but um, the electrons in the bond go again. That's right. If you had filled in some partial charges, the uh, bromine is more electronegative than the carbon, so we've got a polar bond. So bromine already has more than its fair share of the electrons. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> it was the OH minus the back of the C, as I remember it. 
Now we're telling people about it. We're playing that right. I don't. We're at OH minus with carbon. To the carbon? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I didn't get the back door. You, you, you don't need back, to worry. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so we have, a, we have a second curly arrow that goes from... Oh, it's a good squeak. Uh, it goes from the lone pair on the, uh, the OH- minus to the carbon. So remember that the curly arrow shows us... What is the curly arrow? The movement of how many electrons? A pair of electrons, the movement of electrons. So it's not the OH minus that's attacking, although <coughs> presumably it has to kind of follow along behind. It's the electrons that are doing the attacking. Okay. So one came in, one went out, the OH is now there, and the Br minus is left behind. Um, notice that. Sodium has no part in this mechanism because it's really a spectator ion. We don't need to include it in the mechanism. Okay, that's great. Right. Now, I'd like you to write what you think is the rate equation for that reaction, please. What would you expect the rate equation to be for that reaction? Don't look it up, Matthew. I'm asking you what you would expect it to be. Is there a K to that? Oh, is it K? Can I have a rate equation without a K? Okay, so the rate equation always starts with rate equals. Rate equals. Something, 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 something. Is that something like that? Kieran, can you tell us what you got for that, please? <laughs> the, the brackets are pronounced concentration of. So concentration of NaOH, yeah? Anybody have anything different from that? It's a reasonable assumption to make because we need these two reactants to, to get together. If I have less OH minus, then the reaction's gonna go slower because it's not around to attack the bromoethane. If I have less bromoethane, the reaction's gonna go slower because the bromoethane's not around to be attacked. So would the um, CBR, in concentration of CBR bonds, be concentration of OH minus? No, so the, it's always the reactants that go into our rate equation. The stuff that's usually, usually our rate equation is, is related to our reaction equation. So the, the reactants, as stated here, end up in our rate equation. Yes? Yeah. yeah. So if I had H plus there, I could put H plus down here. That would be fine. But but use your rate equation as your guide. Sorry, use the actual equation as the guide for what to put in your rate equation. I think I might have got that mixed up. But the... I, I don't know. So there would it be um, the concentration of bromine ions, the concentration of OH ions? Did Mark say that? Or did he say C? No, I'm, I'm, fine. I'm, I'm fine with what we've got. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the answer. That is the answer, yeah. Oh, that was wrong. No, I wasn't looking for anything uh, suited, suitably clever. I mean, I, you could, if I change the equation there to make that OH minus, if I made that the equation, then my rate equation would become that. Then. Okay, so the two marry up. All right? Okay. Um,
Uh, I'm going to leave that off. Let's do uh, a different reaction now. Okay. Um, Finn, what's that called? No, sorry, the name of that molecule. I want an IUPAC name for that molecule. What's the longest chain in that molecule? You're nearly there. When we're listing groups, they always go alphabetical, so it should be lovely. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we're going to do a very similar reaction. I'm sure you can see the similarities between um, this and, and the reaction we just did. And again, we're going to attack our molecule with, with OH minus. Um, but it turns out that this reaction has to proceed in a slightly different way because the methyl groups that I've, I've added here, these are the new, the new stuff, uh, around either side are quite, quite big. I mean, they're carbons with three hydrogens sticking out, and bromine's not a small atom. Uh, anyway, it's, you know, it's quite a long way down the periodic table. So we've got a fairly large atom here and fairly large methyl groups here. And it, it just means it's physically difficult for an OH minus and, and the electrons, which of course all, all repel as well, to, to physically fit into that space. So the reaction only happens, and it's interesting that we, we had this conversation first about you know which goes first. Uh, the reaction only happens if bromine goes first. So I'm going to introduce a, a step there. Is this one? Organic chemistry. This is organic chemistry, yes, although um, um, there's obviously an overlap here between the organic and the inorganic. Physical. Physical, even. Thank you. Okay, so the bromine has to come off first, so we break the carbon-bromine bond, giving the electrons that are in the bond to the bromine. So Br- minus has gone off, there we are, it's over there somewhere, it's left the building. And now we've got a carbon with a whole plus charge on it, different from a partial charge. You know, we often do these, we often see these little delta pluses, that means like a small scrap of a, of a plus charge, but now we're looking at a whole plus charge. Is that, is that a, that's a carbon cation? That is a carbocation. That was my next question. Thank you very much. That is a carbocation. Okay. Um, so what happens next? Well, now we have the second part of the reaction, which is... Oh, let's just have that come in. There we go. The electrons from the OH- minus come in. Uh, probably pretty quickly and make our product. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. But notice the two curly arrows are the same as in the last mechanism. It's just that they they're happening in two separate steps now. Like an intermediate step, like a, um, That is an intermediate. Very good. Carbocation intermediate. Look how these words are just flowing out of you. You've obviously learnt your organic chemistry well. Um, is it a primary, secondary, or a tertiary carbocation? It's a tertiary carbocation intermediate. 
Does that make it more or less stable than a primary? More stable. More stable. Okay, so so one of the reasons why this mechanism works for uh, for for the, um, the, the the substituted propane is because this carbocation is a bit stable and it'll probably hang around for a bit longer. Um, often the, the first step in an organic reaction is, is actually reversible. So the carbocation might form and then it might bump into a bromide and go back to being the reactant again. That's why organic reactions, you might, as you see, you talked about reflux, you might have to leave your organic chemicals refluxing in a corner for an hour and a half and come back to them you know, after lunch. You have to sort of leave them stewing. It's because you're waiting for these processes to, to take place. Okay, so important information. This first process happens slowly, whereas the second process, minus meets plus, it's love at first sight, that happens fast. Okay, so step one is a slow step, step two is a fast step. Why okay. step two faster than step one? Why is step two faster than step one? Step one. Like Why is it fast? Yeah. It's fast because, well, there's a couple of reasons. This this involves bond breaking, which, as I'm sure you remember, is an endothermic process. It requires energy to, to pull two atoms apart. Yeah. Um, whereas this is bond forming, exothermic. But this also involves the meeting of a plus and a minus. So they're going to be attracting each other, pulling each other together like the north and south poles of magnets, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna come in. So um as, if there's an OH minus in you know in the vicinity of a carbon plus it'll, it'll just bang and they'll they'll get together. Whereas we might be waiting around quite a long time with our little bubbling flask waiting for those those bromines to come off. Okay. Right, let's get back to the point of this which is the rate equation. Could you write for me please the rate equation for this reaction? So you, you have to do a sodium hydroxide in this scenario. You can either use sodium hydroxide or, as we talked about last, you could write OH minus in the rate equation. That's fine. That's acceptable. Uh, I haven't actually given you the overall reaction equation, but um, either would be fine. So uh, I'm just going to write this molecule as CH3, 3 CBr. Okay, that's just a shorthand way of writing that. Oh, and we need K. Don't we? Okay, K. And that's it. That's the rate equation for this reaction. There's no OH. There is no OH. Or... To put it another way, we could say OH is zero order. In other words, concentration of OH minus does not affect the rate. Why? Why? That's the next question I was going to ask you. Why is OH minus not in the rate equation? Yeah. It's not a spectator. I wouldn't call it a spectator because the spectator ion doesn't get involved in any step of the reaction. But it's it's not part of the first step of the reaction. And importantly, the first step of the reaction is the slow step. And if you've got any process, if you've got you know a series of things you have to do, 
in order to get something done. The slower step is always going to be the one which determines how fast the process goes overall. We call that the rate determining step. And the example I give in the topic booklet is washing up. If you've got, if you've got Christmas Day or a big, big uh, sort of family celebration, let's imagine we don't have a dishwasher in this house, we're, we're old school. And so Christmas Day, you know, big table, big family, 12 people around. And you'll often find, if you've got a reasonably functional family, that everyone helps clear up at the end. So people are collecting plates and they're bringing them into the kitchen and putting them next to the sink. And, and maybe, you know, a few people grab some tea towels as well. And they're grabbing the washed plates that come off the, come off the rack and drying them up and putting them away. So you've got lots of people helping clear the table. You've got lots of people putting stuff away. But you can only have one person at the sink. In, in my picture in the diagram, it's kind, of, it's kind of dad. That's how I imagine. Dad's at the sink washing up. Okay, lots of people clearing up, lots of people putting away. But only one person can wash up. So he, in this case, determines the rate at which the whole process goes because that's the slower step. Doesn't matter how many people you've got clearing up and it doesn't matter how many people you've got putting away, the rate of which the washing up gets done all depends on him. So the slowest step determines the rate of the whole process. So that's what we mean by the rate determining step. It's the slowest step in a reaction process or reaction mechanism. Rate determining step. So in this mechanism, OH minus, John described it as a spectator rhyme, but it, not quite the right word, but it is literally sitting around waiting. It's waiting for those bromines to come off. We need the carbocations to appear before OH minus can jump in and finish the reaction. So if I change the concentration of OH minus, it's not going to make a great deal of difference to the rate because it's literally just sitting around waiting for the bromines to fall off. If I change the concentration of the, the halo alkane, that'll make a big difference. If I've got less of this, then obviously I'm going to make less carbocations or make carbocations less frequently. But adding more OH- minus won't make a lot of difference. Is this the same for every like, nucleophilic nucleophilic group of OH-? Minus, or is it only certain molecules like um, T-bones and stuff like that? Right, so there are two different types of nucleophilic substitution. You will be very grateful to hear that you don't need to know the difference. And if you, if you give either of these mechanisms in an exam, you know, bromine comes off first and then OH- comes in, or they both happen at the same time, you, you will get full marks. Okay? They, they have different names. They're, 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 they're called, um, this is SN1, if you're interested. Uh, that stands for substitution nuclear one, where the one means first order. Because it's first order with respect to the halo alkane. The other one's called SN2 because it's second order overall, because you have to take in the OH minus. That's off the syllabus. You don't have to know the difference between SN1 and SN2. But if you were to look it up or look at resources for the first year of degree, you'd see quite a lot of stuff about SN1 and SN2. I'll go over that. The important thing as far as you're concerned is because the first step is slow and because OH- doesn't appear in the mechanism until the second step, OH- does not appear in the rate equation. And that sounds like a fundamental rule. So let's write that down. Of course, yeah. So a substance is zero order in the rate equation if it only appears after the rate determining step. Can I call that RDS for the moment? 
I don't know if that's an appropriate shorthand to use in the exam, but since we've written a title up there, we can get away with that. So if a substance is a substance is zero order in the rate equation if it only appears after the rate determining step. If you have one like these before and after that. Ah. Okay. That was that was rule number. Well, I think I should be rule zero actually, because it's zero order. Um, so the flip side of that is a substance is first order in the rate equation. Oh, no, I have no working pens. Oh, nice. If it appears in or before. The rate determining step. So 2 bromo 2 methyl propane appears in the rate determining step, so therefore it's first order in the rate equation. OH minus doesn't, so it's zero. Since OH minus doesn't appear, why is it in the mechanism? Why, why is it why is it, why is it, why is it in the mechanism in the still takes part in the reaction? Yeah, but wouldn't wouldn't you just do it in this step too? Yes, yes, I, I, yeah, I didn't need to put it there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what you mean. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Logic tells us there must be another, there must be another part to this. So, um, what I should say is, um, the order in which we would we would do this is, is it's kind of the other way around. What you do, you get a reaction and you don't know the rate equation for that reaction. The only way to work out the rate equation for a reaction is how do we work out a rate equation? And doing different concentrations of the same reaction. That's it, we have to do the reaction, do some practical chemistry, get a lab coat on, do some different concentrations, find the rate. For each concentration, use that information to work out the rate order with respect to each reactant. That will give us our, our rate equation. Then we'd use that to help us work out the mechanism. It goes in that order. So we, we don't know the mechanism for reactions. There's no way you can sort of look at a flask reacting and go, oh, that's nucleophilic substitute. You know, you can't, you can't see that, can you? So the, the rate equation gives us information about the mechanism. It would, Go that way around. Right. Um, I, I don't know a, a second order reaction, so I just made one up. And I'm just literally copying this straight out of the book. Right, so in this reaction, A and B react quickly to make some sort of intermediate AB. Okay, just have to trust me on this. In step two, why have I done with that nice pen? It was right there. What one are you looking for? Orange. The nice one. Ah, very well. Slightly different blue. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, in step two, AB reacts with another B to make uh, uh, an, another intermediate. We'll call that AB2. Yeah, I know. And then in step three, that AB2 reacts with C and that makes D and E. And that step is fast as well. So step two, step two is the rate yes. determining step. The slowest step in a reaction is always the rate determining step. Okay. Do you want to have a guess at the rate equation for this reaction? Take a guess. Don't cheat now.
see what you got. So, uh, a lot of people have sort of got a hunch of where this is going. So, first of all, um, A appears in or before, appears before the rate determining step. So, a substance is first order in the rate equation if it appears in or before the rate determining step. So, A is first order. Okay, we're all happy with that. C? Well, C doesn't appear in or before the rate determining step. So, zero order if it appears after the rate determining step. So, C will be zero order. Okay, so the, the interesting one here is B. B appears, sorry, B appears in the first step and it appears in the second step, and both steps are in or before the rate determining step. So B has appeared twice. It's going to affect the rate of the first reaction, it's going to affect the rate of the second reaction. And that's why things are second order. That's actually the only reason why reactants are second order. And that's our last rule. So. All right, I'll ask you a question. If, if B appears in or, oh, so it's in and before the second. Exactly right. Not, not in or before. Okay. So a substance is second order in the rate equation if it appears in or before the rate determining step twice. Substance is second order if it appears in or before the rate determining step twice. Yeah. Is there a kind of like a limit to like you ne even never get an equation where it appears three times in no. or it's Second order is incredibly rare, which is why I use A's and B's, because the examples I've found on the internet of actual second order reactions are incredibly complicated. Um, but but they do exist. As in third order just to be it appears three times before, but it's still they still second order. No, you don't. You don't have any third order. Yes, so it's still second order, no matter how many times it, if it yeah. exceeds two times. Having having a reactant appear twice before the uh, the rate determining step is very very rare. If it does not occur. Times. You don't get you don't get reactants appearing three times. I can't even imagine how that would look. If you go on, if you go on and ask the question in Google, why are there no third order? Reactants, you, you might get an answer that's a bit more, it's a bit more meaningful than there aren't any. But um, again, B is very uh, second order is very rare. Okay, there is a question. Where's the question? Uh, it's question three on page seventeen. 